And I want to welcome you to the Application Architecture Summit Expert Breakout Session. This is the breakout session for New Relic, and let me welcome back Lee Atchison, Senior Director of Strategic Architecture for New Relic. Lee, welcome back. Thanks, Vance. It's great to be here. You know, we're really glad to have Lee with us here, too. He leads the building of the New Relic infrastructure products and has helped New Relic architect a solid service-based system. He brings 30 years of software and infrastructure experience to his current posts with specific expertise in building highly available systems. And in fact, prior to New Relic, Lee was a senior manager at Amazon.com for seven years, where one of his focuses was cloud-based and scalable systems. And you may know his name as he's the author of O'Reilly Media's just released Architecting for Scale. In his session today, Monitoring the Dynamic Cloud, Lee brings all those things together to help us really understand some of the dynamic and static issues that go with migrating to this cloud. Many folks use the cloud now, but mostly as an extension to their data center. Lee will explore how the dynamic cloud looks to help improve apps get data to those apps and improve performance. He'll also talk about some of the leading technologies Amazon and other cloud services are providing developers and IT operations. You can download Lee's slides and even get a host of white papers and other downloads right now. Just click any of the links under the viewing area and all of that's available without any added registration. And to connect with Lee, we love that. Just type in the submit a question box and we'll make sure that he gets your comment or question. And so now, Lee, let me turn it back to you and tell us about monitoring the dynamic cloud. Well, thank you, Vance. It's absolutely great to be here, and I'm very glad to be part of the summit. We all want better apps, and we want to be able to build these apps faster than ever before. Well, how can we use the cloud to accomplish this? There are two fundamental ways. The first is to use the cloud as a better data center. The second is to use the dynamic nature of the cloud to build better apps faster. I'm I'm going to talk about each of these methods. Let's first look at the cloud as a better data center. What do I mean by using the cloud as a better data center? I mean, resources are allocated to uses just like they are in a regular data center, but the provisioning process for new resources is significantly faster than it is for a traditional data center. The lifetime of the resources you create are relatively long, usually measured in days, weeks, months, or even years. However, even with a faster provisioning process, traditional capacity planning techniques are still important and they still apply. But why would we want to use the cloud simply as a better data center? What are the benefits to us building applications? Since we can add new capacity faster, we can build and scale our applications easier in the cloud. In addition to adding servers easier and quicker, we can add entirely new data centers easier, which can improve our application availability and our application redundancy. In addition, this ability to add additional data centers can improve our compliance, especially when it comes to things like EU safe harbor laws. So who is impacted the most by the decision to develop applications using the cloud as a better data center? Well, your operations teams are certainly impacted. They have to deal with questions such as, can this application run on cloud servers? and make use of cloud capabilities to scale their server fleets. But for your development organization, using the cloud as a better data center is mostly a no-op. To them, a cloud or a data center is a data center. It doesn't matter if it's a cloud-based data center or a regular data center. They just frankly don't care. A question that comes up when migrating an application from a regular data center to a cloud data center is, given the cloud has some monitoring capabilities built into it, how should I monitor my applications? What do I need to do to monitor my application in the cloud? Well, to answer this question, we have to take a look at what makes up our static applications. Our applications run on EC2 instances, which run on some form of virtual server hardware. They also may run on mobile or browser devices as well. But CloudWatch, which is the built-in AWS monitoring capabilities of the cloud, monitors the virtual hardware 
in the EC2 instance only. It doesn't monitor the OS memory process configuration issues or anything at all about the application. To monitor the application, you need an application performance monitoring solution, something like New Relic. With this, you get application health and performance, microservice health and performance, and a more complete infrastructure level monitoring, such as how the operating system is performing, configuration monitoring, et cetera. An application performance monitoring solution combined with the built-in CloudWatch monitoring of the cloud can give you a full stack visibility in the cloud for how your application is operating. So now let's switch to talking about using the cloud as a dynamic environment. So what do I mean by using the cloud as a dynamic tool for dynamic applications in this environment? I mean, use only the resources you need, allocate and deallocate the resources you need on the fly, and resource allocation itself becomes an integral part of your application architecture. In a dynamic application, resources are allocated, consumed, and deallocated on the fly. And the application is aware of and is controlling this management of resources. The application is essentially performing traditional ops resource management tasks. Now, New Relic did an analysis recently about how our customers are making use of a technology called Docker. The question we wanted to answer was, how long do Docker containers typically last? How long do they typically live for? This diagram shows the results of that investigation. The horizontal axis is the number of hours a Docker container has lived for that we're monitoring. And the vertical axis is the number of containers that are within that particular time bucket. So as you can see, there's a very, very long tail with some Docker containers running for well over a year. In fact, our longest running Docker container that we have in our systems been running for over two years at 833 days. However, there is a huge number of Docker containers that run for less than one hour. In fact, the very leftmost column there, which represents the one hour bucket, if we zoom in on just that one hour interval, we can see that most Docker containers we run actually not only run for less than one hour, they actually run for less than one minute. In fact, over 11% of all Docker containers that we monitor that are running in systems that we're monitoring will run for less than 60 seconds. This is some customer's application or, or service, some business logic that starts up, runs, and shuts down in less than 60 seconds. This is very rapid. These are containers that are launched only for a specific business purpose. They're provisioned for a single task and are terminated when that purpose is completed. This is what we mean by a dynamic infrastructure. And there are lots of different cloud technologies that can be used in this dynamic manner from queues to routing to auto-scaled EC2 instances. Many resources in the cloud can be used in this dynamic fashion. This brings up an interesting concern. If resources are coming and going so rapidly, how can you monitor them? How do you monitor a dynamic application running in a dynamic cloud? Well, here's an example of a dynamic application. It looks much like the static application, but it might have more services and microservices that compose the application. That's pretty typical of more modern application development. We still have CloudWatch monitoring the low-level cloud infrastructure. And we still have what I would call traditional application performance monitoring that monitors the static nature of the application components themselves. Overall, this provides 
almost top to bottom monitoring of the entire application, almost. But what about this piece? How do you monitor the provisioning process itself? When provisioning is now part of the application, you're provisioning resources that don't last for years or months or days, but for seconds. Given the resources that are coming and going regularly, how do you monitor that? How do you monitor components that are there one minute, but less than 60 seconds later, they're gone? Remember the Docker numbers we showed you. It turns out that monitoring a dynamic application in a dynamic cloud is very different than monitoring traditional data center components. You must, of course, still monitor each of the individual cloud components themselves, each of the services and resources and components that make up the application. But you also must monitor the life cycle of those cloud components. This is because it matters not only that a resource was used, it matters when that resource was used. Because just looking at the resources running right now is inadequate when trying to diagnose a problem that occurred even just a few minutes ago. The resources that were in use when a problem occurred are not the same resources in use now. So who's impacted when you use the cloud in this highly dynamic fashion? When we talked about using the cloud simply as a better data center, we said your ops teams are the ones most impacted and that your development team pretty much didn't care less. But when we talk about using a dynamic application in a dynamic cloud, things change a lot. Your operations team still cares, but their concerns are different. They were comfortable with what they needed to do in a static cloud, but in this dynamic cloud environment, well, frankly, they're scared. They're scared because their world has changed. They no longer have a simple spreadsheet of resources that they can manage. They now have resources that are getting created and destroyed dynamically by the application itself. The resources themselves that they monitor are being created and destroyed outside of their control. And this is scary to them. Meanwhile, your development team now also cares about your cloud usage. This is because the cloud architecture is an integral part of the application architecture now. Developers of dynamic applications care deeply about the cloud and the cloud activities. So in the old world, your operations team was comfortable. They knew the resources they controlled. They created those resources. They managed them. They had spreadsheets of them. All was simple. All was manageable. But in this new world, resources are created and destroyed dynamically. The world of the operations team can no longer be as simple as tracking resources on a spreadsheet. The resources they are responsible for are dynamic and the resources are transient. The world has gotten a lot more complicated for them. The dynamic cloud has caused significant change to our world. Our world has sped up and the rate of change in application development has increased. The cloud alone has sped things up, and the dynamic cloud has sped things up even more. The way you've done things in the past just won't work in the future. The speed up has happened because of technologies like EC2 in the cloud and the use of technologies like Docker containers. And this alone is hard, but it's getting harder because now we have Lambda. While EC2 instances might run for hours or days or weeks, Docker containers might run for seconds, Lambda functions run for milliseconds. Let's talk a little bit about what Lambda is and how it works. Lambda is the newest entrance to this dynamic cloud infrastructure we're talking about. It provides an event-driven compute capability with no infrastructure to provision 
and it takes advantage of a massively shared infrastructure for its execution. Provisioning of Lambda is provisioning things that run for milliseconds, not days or weeks or months or even hours, milliseconds. Lambda scripts have virtually no startup or shutdown cost, and they run in response to some sort of state change that occurs in the cloud itself. They're designed to perform a quick action, some sort of small action that is needed in response to something going on within the cloud application itself. So the way Lambda works is essentially, it waits for some sort of resource in AWS to do something. This is called the trigger. This might be a file that gets written to an S3 bucket, or it might be a call to an API gateway, or an update to a database, like a DynoDB database, or some sort of message stored into a queue. When that trigger occurs, a Lambda script is executed that's pre-set up in advance that processes that trigger. And the result of that Lambda instance running is to perhaps create some different AWS resource or modify the original one. It, it might be a response to an API call. It might update a table. It might create a brand new file and store it in a different S3 bucket. It doesn't matter, but it's some sort of small action. So you end up with these functions that come into being in response to a trigger and perform some action. But the key here is it doesn't matter how many of these are running at a time. If instead of one file getting written to S3, you have 100,000 files getting written to S3 at the exact same moment, 100,000 instances of Lambda will be created for you instantly, process each of those files independently, and do whatever they're supposed to do, like create the new file in S3 or whatever they're supposed to do. And they all run simultaneously. The Lambda script is essentially infinitely scalable. Let's talk about a couple specific example uses of Lambda. I want to first talk about a photo man management app. Imagine, if you will, an application that allows you to upload photographs to the cloud and then an application that allows you to see thumbnails and metadata associated with those photographs and, and, and manipulate them in some way. A photo management app. But what you might do to implement this is you might allow users to upload the photographs into an S3 bucket, some sort of image import bucket. Well, you can create a Lambda script then that says every time that a new photograph is uploaded to that S3 bucket, it'll take that image and create from that image a thumbnail, do whatever execution is needed in order to create a thumbnail version of that image and store that image in a different bucket that has all the thumbnail images in it. At the same time, you might have another Lambda script that takes the same image that's been uploaded and have it pull metadata, you know, what time it was taken, where it was taken, et cetera, and store that information into some sort of image database. An image database can be available to the rest of the application that performs whatever functions you need for this user. Well, what's interesting about this sort of architecture for this application is the ingestion process itself, the process of ingesting new photographs into this application using Lambda is essentially infinitely scalable. It doesn't matter if you're uploading simultaneously one photo to the bucket or 100,000 photos to the bucket, once those photos are there, instantly thumbnails will be created for all of them by whatever number of Lambda scripts are necessary to make that happen. And your image data will be automatically updated with all of the information for all of the files, all of the photographs of all of the metadata automatically by whatever number of Lambda scripts are needed to make that happen. The application only has to deal with editing the metadata as necessary, not the upload process itself. The upload process itself is infinitely scalable. Look at a second example. 
imagine if you will, you're the developer of some sort of mobile game application. In this game, let's say you end up with a score and you want to store the scores on a server so that you can get a list of high scores of all the users of your mobile game, who has the highest score, a top 10 list, if you will. How would you implement something like that? Well, you'd have this mobile game call some sort of API back in the cloud. Well, you could build that API in the cloud by using an API gateway that's backed just completely and totally by Lambda scripts. There doesn't have to be any servers involved in this. The Lambda scripts can do the work necessary to store whatever new scores are coming in into the database, generate the top 10 list, and give that top 10 list to anybody who's asking for it. The Lambda scripts themselves implement the API that the mobile game uses in order to set and get that information. What's nice about this is the same application, the same architecture with no change will work if you have 10 users of your game simultaneously or a million users simultaneously. It doesn't matter how popular your game gets. The same system, the same architecture, the same application continues to work because the resources needed in order to run the application are dynamically provisioned as they're needed, perform their function very, very quickly, and are terminated when they're no longer needed. You only are using resources when you need them, and you're using only as many resources as you need, but you are using as many resources as you need for whatever type of scale you need at that particular moment. So how do you monitor these Lambda scripts? Well, these Lambda scripts, even though they kind of look like your infrastructure, they're your server backends, you don't care about the typical server infrastructure metrics that you normally think of. You know, things like CPU percentage and memory, those aren't the things you care about. What you care about is the more statistical metrics. You care about runtime. How long did it take for this Lambda script to run? How fast was the API response? How many errors occurred? And were there any deviations from the normal in these statistical metrics? And if there were some deviations, you might want to drill down into those individual Lambda runs that had a problem. But for the most part, you care about the statistical average of how everything works. You care about execution time care about throughput and error rates. This looks a much more like a typical application performance monitoring than an infrastructure performance monitoring. You're not monitoring an infrastructure anymore. You're monitoring your infrastructure more like an application because the infrastructure itself is mostly invisible to you. It used to be long ago that all it took to make sure your application was running was to look at the server. Did the amount of CPU or memory utilization change? Did a memory heap size grow as time went on? Was there a spike in CPU usage? Those were the sorts of indications that you needed to know that your application was having a problem. If they didn't change, your application was fine. If they changed, your application had a problem. Change was equated to problem because everything was static, everything was smooth, everything was constant. A change was a problem. But in a dynamic world, this is no longer the case. The rate of change of the applications themselves is so much faster. And the resource allocation itself is much more dynamic. No longer can simple static checks be sufficient to make your application, to make sure it's functioning correctly because things are changing so much, those simple checks just don't work anymore. Problems come up much quicker. A server isn't even a server anymore. And certainly, as we've seen, provisioning isn't traditional provisioning anymore. In order to monitor your dynamic applications in this dynamic cloud, you must monitor all aspects of the application, top to bottom, using a full stack monitoring solution. Solutions such as New Relic. Moving to a dynamic cloud does not have to be scary. It does not have to be complicated. Dynamic cloud resources allow you to build applications that can scale easily 
and rapidly. Using New Relic, you can get full stack accountability between your dynamic code and the developers that are producing the applications for your dynamic cloud, and the operations teams that are managing the dynamic application. That's what using dynamic applications is all about. And that's what fully utilizing what the cloud has to offer is all about. Thank you. And now let me turn it back to Vance to see if there's any questions that are coming up. Fantastic. Lee, what a terrific session. A really good look at the state of where we are today in kind of the cloud adoption maturity model, if that's a phrase, going from static to dynamic, and then the whole new world that opens up for how I can reconfigure my, my apps to take advantage of this dynamic infrastructure. A really, really terrific session. Well, thank you. You know, Lee, it's no surprise that we're inundated here with some questions. So let's start with some basic ones and then get into a few of the gnarly but very intriguing issues that you bring up in your talk. As a baseline, the question comes in, does the speaker see all cloud-based apps fall into one of those two models, either static or dynamic? Well, it's possible that some applications may use a combination of techniques and it may appear in some respects to look like a static app and in other respects, they might appear more like a dynamic app. In these cases, both models can apply to the application, the standard modeling, as well as the dynamic modeling. What they'll probably find is that the sophistication that's needed to monitor the dynamic aspects is more overwhelming and more involved than the static aspects, and the static aspects kind of come along for free. Oh, that makes sense. So in other words, as you migrate from a kind of data center model into this sort of app needs service, app needs awareness of something else, app needs to scale, that's where the migration kind of goes from static to dynamic. That's right. And it's probably over a continuum over time as they're doing the migration. They start out simple with the data center based approach and over time they increase their maturity, if you will, into using the more dynamic capabilities. Right. So let's focus a little bit on this dynamic portion, which it seems to be kind of where all the excitement is now. Certainly many folks know about using the cloud for scale, but a question comes in for the developer side and it says, why does using these dynamic methods in the cloud make application development faster or easier? Well, I think the main benefit comes from understanding how to build an application for scale. With traditional static applications, determining how to scale the application is something that involves predicting traffic patterns, predicting how long different parts of the application will take to execute, understanding what your traffic expectations from your customers are, and figuring out what the capacity you need to make that work is. It essentially requires a crystal ball phase where you're guessing at what you need and tweaking it over time. But with dynamic applications that allocate the resources they need on the fly, they don't have to worry about that scaling. The scaling is done automatically and on demand. And so what this really means is that they can change how a piece of functionality within the application works without it affecting the infrastructure needed to run that application. Because the change that might take more resources or less resources the scaling necessary to make that work just automatically works. You don't have to factor that into your development process. You know, this whole topic of resource allocation, there are probably a couple of questions here about that, but let me see if I can summarize them and, and we can continue this conversation. And just to be clear, the question says, is the speaker saying that resource allocation is now part of my app and part of my cloud infrastructure? or is it simply part of my app and I don't worry about the underlying infrastructure? I think that comes down to whether your app is a completely dynamic app or some sort of mixture of static and dynamic. And, and in reality, most applications are probably some sort of mixture. But if it is completely dynamic and uses completely dynamic capabilities, like the simple example I gave of the mobile game app, if it is completely dynamic like that, you literally don't have to worry about the infrastructure. Your, your financial officer may have to worry about it from when they start seeing how much it costs to run this thing, but the costs are more dynamic based on needs. So as long as your value you're getting out of running the application is in proportion to 
the actual use of the application, that shouldn't be an issue. And so for a true, completely dynamic application, you don't have to worry at all about the infrastructure. Wow, what a great conversation. You know, let's talk a little bit about New Relic's capabilities in these dimensions, Lee. One question comes in, how does New Relic know so much about third-party cloud architectures and the performance metrics of a custom-built app? Sure. So we run a series of agents, essentially, that go within your application, that go within your infrastructure, and self-instrument the application and the infrastructure for you in order to get that information and send it back to our software as a service application where we make that information available to you in a variety of dashboards and other sorts of capabilities. So essentially when you build your application, you include our agent and the agent discovers, if you will, how the application is functioning and what information it needs to collect in order to get this performance information. Same thing's true with the infrastructure itself. The infrastructure agent you install collects and figures out what the infrastructure is and sends that information back to us. And in the case of the cloud itself, we make use of calls into the cloud APIs in order to get information that the cloud provides to us, such as CloudWatch and other services. And we get that information and send that back as well too. And in fact, we do have a partnership with AWS that allows us to know what sorts of things they're working on in the future so we can stay ahead of what they're producing so that as they produce a new capability, we can monitor that capability very quickly. That was such a great discussion, Lee. It kind of brings us back to one of your more eye-popping slides, at least to me, that showed about the length of duration of many Docker containers. And I'm assuming to some extent that capability is what gave you the visibility to share that data with us. Exactly. The information we collect, we can show you as a customer very, very detailed information, but there's some aggregate level information that we can collect and discover trends that our customers are using, et cetera, which helps us figure out which products are useful and which capabilities we need to emphasize, et cetera. And it, it helps us build a better product. Fantastic. You know, there's a question about that here and it says, I was kind of shocked to see how many Docker containers last for only a minute or less. Can the speaker give us more detail on what types of business tasks are they doing anyway? They could be all sorts of different things. They're typically performing some sort of standalone job that's part of the application, but is some sort of standalone activity. It might be a background task that's needed to run as part of an application or a, a customer request or it might be just some sheer background task that runs occasionally for some reason, you know, clean up or something like that. But it's usually some form of standalone asynchronous job or activity that's needed for some purpose. They could also be application or service instances that are launched for short periods of time to handle a traffic spike. If you look at, again, the scaling needs, if you have an application that has very, very, very spiky traffic needs, for short periods of time, you might need additional resources running in order to handle those requests. And while more often than not, those might be longer than 60 seconds, they could be as short as 60 seconds. And they, they could be run for very short periods of time in order to handle the spiky traffic, depending on the traffic patterns of the application itself. Oh, fantastic. Here's a question about customer experience. It's a pretty hot topic at the show, Lee, as you might expect. And it reads, I think I saw a slide that says New Relic's full stack accountability does embrace ability to monitor and manage customer experience. Can the speaker give an example of how New Relic improved customer experience for a certain type of application? New Relic will often allow our customers do things like find areas within their application that are running slowly. So like this might show as a page load time to one of our customers' customers where a page loads too slowly and it might affect the customer reaction. For instance, a new site might find that certain pages within the new site run very, very slowly and therefore customers tend to stay away from those pages. Well, the new site may want to know what those pages are and figure out why they're running slowly. New Relic will show not only which pages are running slowly, but it'll allow you to dig deeper into the details to figure out why it's running slowly and help your developers fix those problems. In addition, it can help you 
make sure that your application is running successfully. If you deploy a new version of your software, of a service or the application as a whole, you might introduce a bug that causes some sort of problem to occur. And yes, your customers will let you know when that happens, the Twitter support, if you will. But with New Relic, you can actually see that that's happening before your customer complaints come in and fix the problems. It gives you visibility into your application, into your infrastructure, into your service, into your cloud that allows you to show how it's running, how well it's running, and what areas of the application are doing well and which areas of the application are not. And just a quick follow-up on that, Lee, especially as people begin to think more about DevOps and bringing the front end and the back end people together. In a world where apps are dynamic and now infrastructure is dynamic and even dynamic in a second by second, if not microsecond basis, does New Relic offer any instruction or insight about, okay, is this a provisioning issue? Is this a coding issue? Because some of these resources may, like you said in your presentation, be so tertiary that they're not even there when it comes to the postmortem. What does New Relic do to help folks take that next step to improve that application? Sure, a number of areas, but probably the best example is if you look at how we monitor your infrastructure. Let's look at EC2 servers. As your application runs, you may launch new servers, terminate servers, scale up the number of servers to handle peak load, and then terminate them when you're done. And and that could be your dynamic resource. One of the things that our infrastructure product will do is it will monitor each of those as they start up. It'll tell you how many are running. It'll tell you when they were started and when they were terminated. And it'll give you information about what's unique about each of those servers and how it might be working differently from other servers. And I'll store that information in a historical record. If you got a page from your systems that there's an alert saying that you had a problem at such and such period of time, you come in and you try and figure out what it is. You're trying to figure out at this point in time what problem might have existed. New Relic can tell you at that time which servers were running, what the configuration of those servers that were running at that moment were, and what the load and CPU memory of those servers were at that particular moment for that particular servers that were running then. Not the ones that are running now, but the ones that were running then. And that'll help you figure out what was going on with your application at that time. The same level of capability exists at the application level as well as the infrastructure level and the cloud level. Fantastic. Fantastic. You know, Lee, before you go, you mentioned you have a cloud-based approach toward providing your services. I wonder if you could share how people could learn more or go hands-on either with a sandbox or a free trial of New Relic. Sure. There's some links below I know that you can click on to get more information about us or come to newrelic.com and sign up for a free trial and would love to hear from you. Lee, this has been a terrific session. I especially love the fact that you've taken us to a better understanding, I think, of let's call it the Rubik's Cube challenge of being able to monitor and troubleshoot a dynamic app running in a dynamic infrastructure. And to know that there are some just rock solid anchors that we can use as we go into the brave new world of the dynamic cloud has really been a great eye-opening session for me. Thanks very much for a great session. Well, thank you, Vance. I very much appreciate your time. Lee Atchison, Senior Director of Strategic Architecture from New Relic. It's been a great session, and you mentioned several other resources. We're going to put a slide up here so that people can take advantage of the other great resources and the different flavors of service that New Relic offers for its full-stack approach. Thanks again.